Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is that three Arab Gulf states have asked Sheba Hospital, located in Israel, for help in treating COVID-19 patients. Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and probably Kuwait have reached out to the Israeli hospital in Ramat Gan. That move is nothing shy of seismic in terms of the change in diplomacy. The contact was made directly to the hospital, not through political agents or diplomats. It seems that members of the royal families and their emissaries traveled to Israel to visit the hospital in March. Apparently, they liked what they saw. The world is watching Israel. Even traditional enemies of Israel are watching, learning and asking guidance and help about COVID-19. Finally, something positive has come out of COVID-19. It's no surprise as to why. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Israel has been a leader in the fight against coronavirus. They closed down, they quarantined, and they tracked more quickly than many other countries. They used the Mossad, that is Israel's clandestine spy organization, uh, their equipment, and uh, the Mossad is equivalent to the CIA, by the way. And also they use the internal security services, which are the Shin Bet, to track people. And all the elements of the spying agencies were tracking Israelis. They tracked those with the virus and those exposed to those with the virus, those in mandated quarantine and those in self-quarantine. Everyone's movements were recorded. After someone tested positive, other people, those who had been in close proximity to that patient, for any amount of time, either outdoors or indoors, over previous several days, received a message. It came in the form of a text message from a strange number, and it instructed them to self-quarantine. And for the most part, the Israelis did. They took their high-level spy technology and turned it on themselves, all to fight the enemy called coronavirus. Certainly, there were questions about civil rights and privacy. And those debates will probably continue on. The Supreme Court has actually begun to listen to and begun ruling on these issues. Never before had Israelis been tracked and monitored with the tools reserved to fight terror and to battle enemies of Israel. But COVID-19 is an enemy, an enemy of all of us. And it paid off. There's no question about it. It paid off in a lot of different ways. For instance, relatively speaking, the numbers in Israel were much lower. They are on track to be among the first of many countries racing to develop an anti-corona vaccine also and medications to fight this deadly virus. Hundreds of uh, millions of dollars have been invested in biotech in Israel. It's been raised and they're betting that Israel's ingenuity uh, to discover the answer will succeed, at least uncover some of the pieces of the puzzle called COVID-19. And an Israeli scientist, uh, and an Israeli scientist has already successfully invented a one-minute test for Corona. One minute. The test is akin to the breathalyzer, and it that we use for testing drugs and alcohol. One breathes in, and 60 seconds later, out comes a positive or negative result. In conference calls and video calls with other world leaders about COVID-19, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has explained how Israel has thus far been successful in attacking coronavirus. What is not clear, and Netanyahu has been very open and direct about it, is what will happen as Israel reopens and returns to normal, especially the reopening of schools and kindergartens and parks and, and pools and, and summer vacation and all the things that happen. What will happen and will there be a spike and how bad that spike will be? Netanyahu spoke to his colleagues about returning to safe routine in the shadow of the virus. That's a quote. And readying for potential second outbreak. In a statement from the Prime Minister's office describing one of these calls, and there were several of them, Netanyahu was quoted as saying, I'm quoting here, in fact, no one knows what will happen. We open our, uh, we open our economies and schools. We must be ready and prepared for an accordion effect and the possibility we'll need to close again. 
He's absolutely correct. The reopen went first to schools, then shopping areas, then Ben Gurion, the international airport, is also on the agenda, of course. Airline executives, as well as leaders of their host countries, are watching Israel's national airport very closely. Israel has issued a protocol and procedure paper for all those who are traveling and setting out uh, procedures describing how travel will be in the future in Israel and probably all around the world. The changes will be made to world travel, there's no doubt. Not just travel to and from Israel uh, will closely resemble, I will say, the, those that were instituted 20 years ago after 9-11. The difference is that um, the rest of the world is now given special place to these issues of corona. Whereas before they weren't even interested in terror, now they're interested in terror because of 9-11. Uh, so for Israel, it was a matter of fine tuning major issues, let's say for instance, in an overhaul of their terror program, as well as the health issues. So what's the bottom line? Travel will take longer, lines will be longer, costs will be higher. Now travelers, not just international travel, travelers, but domestic travelers will have to arrive to airports three hours ahead of their flights. Tests will be done, blood tests probably, temperature, visual evaluation, probably infrared scanning. Hands will be sprayed, all surfaces will be cleaned, and cleaned, and cleaned, and cleaned some more. Baggage allowance will probably be curtailed. Masks and hand covering almost certainly will be required. There is so much we still don't know about COVID-19. Most of the information we do have is frightening and confusing. It's not only uh, uh, nice to get good news, it's also important. If countries once refused to associate with one another, now are seeking each other's counsel and help. If tools traditionally used to fight enemies can be transformed to help friends, we should know about it. We are um, uh, admonished not to share in this time of COVID-19, but that refers to the virus. Sharing successes is one of the best ways the world and we will see itself out of this dark period in history and the shadow it casts over all of our lives. I've also been thinking about uh, what's going on in Syria. Now, in Iran and Syria, two countries are closely aligned. Against all logic, and despite reports from politicians, Iran continues to make Syria a priority. It baffles the mind, actually. It's no secret that Israel was hoping to force Iran out of Syria. The IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, have been targeting Iran and Hezbollah forces in Syria. Israel has spent a billion dollars on the operation, a billion dollars, all in an attempt to add even more pressure to the stifling and uh, humongous weights plaguing Iran. But it's not working. Iran continues in their commitment to maintaining a strong presence in Syria, and by extension in Lebanon. The Iranian commitment to maintain presence in Lebanon and Syria is predicated on the ability to set up a front to attack Israel with the help of Hezbollah as their proxy in Lebanon. After successful assassinations of Qassam Soleimani, the Iranian commander and Revolutionary uh, Guard Corps Quds Force, El Quds Force, by the United States in January outside of Baghdad airport, Israel saw the perfect opportunity. They jumped in and seized the moment. Israel ratcheted up the pressure by striking Iranian bases and centers in Syria. Soleimani, was Iran's most strategic and gifted military thinker and leader. He was responsible for all operations outside of Iran, including those in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, and even in Europe. Over the course of his career, Soleimani was responsible for hundreds of operations and the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands of people. His death toll included Americans, which explains why the United States was involved in targeting and killing this Iranian military mastermind. Now, it's important also to recognize that after Soleimani's assassination, Israel embarked on and targeted a methodical, a consistent campaign to convince Iranian leadership that it was not worth their while to stay in Syria. Their costs would be exorbitant. Israelis were striking Iran and Syrian in Syria with drones, jet fighters, sea-based missiles from ships, and with helicopters. Israel's miscalculated. Jerusalem assumed that Iran would assess the situation and calculate as other countries would. 
that when the costs were too high, you cut your losses and leave. Israel was hoping to persuade Iran to make the right decision, militarily, economically, and politically. But Iran is not like other countries. When you trace the comments of Naftali Bennett, Israel's outgoing defense minister during this period, that was uh, exactly the tone that he set, urging Iran to make the decision and evaluate Syria. But Iran does not make decisions the way other countries make decisions. Hatred is one of Iran's raison d'etre. That means the reason to exist. Iran's hatred towards Israel is one of the, uh, their motivating factors. Hatred for Israel is the fulcrum through which they, Iranian leadership, hopes to galvanize, bring together the entire region under their leadership. There are many factors inhibiting the natural flow of leadership from Iran to the rest of the Middle East. Most importantly, however, uh, the religious differences between Iranians and the rest of the region. Establishing this leadership can only emerge by uniting against Israel. And so, despite the crushing sanctions by both the United States and the United Nations, despite the drop in oil prices to way below any price that could have possibly been expected, despite gargantuan losses of life, especially in the highest echelon of leadership and the high financial cost of COVID-19, Iran continues their policy and stays entrenched in Syria and determined to support President Bashar Assad and his role as leader in Syria. They're also supporting, obviously, Hezbollah. But that's not all. Almost as strong as their hatred of Israel, Iran's visceral fear of Russian influence in the region is their, uh, is their motivation, too. If Iran pulls out of Syria, all resources and the entire area will be uh, default in Russian control. The rebuilding of Syria will fall totally under the control of Russia. Russia will inherit the region and the influence of the region for decades to come. It will be Russia and Russia alone. The United States, you should know, removed itself from the equation. And there is no other world power able or interested in this conquest except Iran. That's why this military dance back and forth, this balancing act is so important to Iran. That's why it's so important to Israel. Israel would prefer Russia to Iran. Not very long ago, when two factories were blown up in Syria, fingers pointed at Israel. They were probably pointed in the right direction. Israel is doing what they need to do. Jerusalem needs to follow through with their decision to strike Iranian and Hezbollah positions in Syria and in the hope of pushing them out. And if it does not happen, if that does not happen, Israel must at least prevent Iranian sponsors buildup and transfer of powerful weapons and training, the training in Syria. And that, so far, Israel has been successful at. Two, the two factories that were struck and decimated were manufacturing long-range Scud-D missiles. Scud-Ds have a range of 700 miles. From anywhere along the Syrian-Israel or Lebanon-Israel border, Hezbollah and Iran can hit with a Scud-D all of Israel, including Beersheba, the capital of Israel's south. Those factories were run by Iranians, Iranian engineers, and uh, also, I kid you not here, North Korean engineers. The Scuds were destined for missile caches of Assad and Hezbollah for the express purpose of attacking Israel. Assad is fighting a civil war in Syria. He has no need for long-range missiles. Israel must continue with their policy. Jerusalem cannot give up the hope of that internal strife in Tehran will overwhelm the event and eventually prevail, and that the Iranian leadership will conclude that Syria is not worth the cost given the hurdles they are confronting. But hope is not enough, and logic does not always prevail. And that's why Israel is exercising military options in Syria against Iran. Coming up, points of view. First up is a column from the Jerusalem Post by Marvin Heyer. It's entitled, Harry Truman, the man from Missouri who helped change Jewish history. It was published May 14th, 2020. Rabbi Heyer is the founder and dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Op-eds serve many roles, and you should know this after watching the show for a long time. Most importantly, they are vehicles that educate. Sometimes they educate about politics. Other times, they're about religion or history. The op-ed becomes a tool through which the author 
can say something important and that, at the same time, most readers would find interesting. This piece about Truman is a perfect example of that style. Truman had very little experience in foreign policy and foreign affairs before he became president. Yet, he helped create the State of Israel and restore world order after World War II, when the world was totally in disarray. It was Truman that pushed forward and recreated a strong world economy. Heyer begins by setting the stage and explaining how Truman became the vice president and then president. Truman was a virtual unknown, but yet he wins the party nomination, the Democratic Party nomination. Get this, in a vote at the convention, Democratic National Convention, 1,031 to 105. Heyer writes, and this is how he begins. On July 20th, 1944, Americans woke to the startling news that an attempt had been made on the life of Adolf Hitler. The Nazi leader survived the attack, but feared for his safety, heeding the advice of his cabinet never to speak in public again. On the same day, thousands of miles across the ocean, delegates, including Senator Harry S. Truman of Missouri, began arriving at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago to nominate President Franklin D. Roosevelt to a fourth term. Truman's assignment was to deliver the speech nominating Senator Jimmy Burns as FDR's vice president to replace the sitting vice president, Henry Wallace. Heyer continues explaining that the White House, seeking options to Henry Wallace, reached out to Truman in the president's name to abandon Burns and to run for vice president himself. Truman, astounded by the request, agreed, and miraculously, though in virtu a virtual unknown to the American public, resoundingly defeated Henry Wallace in the second ballot by a count of 1,031 to 105 to win the nomination for the vice presidency. Now, Heyer explains that FDR was not pro-Jewish state. For most Jews, FDR was a savior, but in this arena, he was pro-Arab. Heyer writes, Truman's commitment to the Jewish state, however, was very different from Roosevelt's. When it came to the Jewish state, Roosevelt could not be trusted. Zionist leaders, to Zionist leaders, FDR made pro-Zionist statements, but when he met with Saudi leader Ibn Saud, the president said, I learned more about the Muslim problem and the Jewish problem by talking to Ibn Saud for five minutes. A few days later, he sent Ibn Saud a letter in which he wrote, I will not undertake as head of the executive branch any action likely to be hostile to the Arab people. As Michael Barzohar, um, David Ben-Gurion's biographer writes, if Roosevelt had completed his term in office, of office, it is doubtful whether a Jewish state would have come into being. Now Truman understood the link between Israel and the Jewish people. He saw the link between the Bible and the Jews. For him, it was a no-brainer. Jews, Israel, and the Bible were all wrapped up into one. Rabbi Heyer concludes with a famous story of a meeting between President Harry Truman and Rabbi Isaac Herzog, the first chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel. The meeting took place in the Oval Office. Heyer writes, when Israel's first chief rabbi, Isaac Herzog, visited the White House to thank Truman, he told him, Mr. President, God put you in your mother's womb so you could be the instrument to bring about the rebirth of Israel after 2,000 years. It was true, but nonetheless, a very bold statement of the chief rabbi to speak so boldly of God's hand and Truman's role in destiny. Higher writes, when the rabbi finished, David Niles, the president's assistant, who was in the room, thought the rabbi may have overdone it until he looked at the president and saw tears running down his cheeks. That is why Harry Truman will never be forgotten by the Jewish people and the friends of Israel. This op-ed actually underscores the importance, the very powerful, meaningful uh, significance of the relationship between Israel and the United States in diplomacy as well as other things, and emphasizes the importance of the relationship between the United States and Israel itself. Next up is a column by Raphael Castro,
published May 18, 2020, in the Algemeiner. It's entitled, How Can We Help Foreign Journalists Understand Israel? What makes this op-ed even more interesting is Rafael Castro is himself a journalist. The Algemeiner was a Yiddish paper founded in 1972. The word Algemeiner means universal in Yiddish. Also, by the way, in, in German, it means the same thing. It means universal. It was originally a universalist paper, a socialist paper. Over time, the Algemeiner has evolved into, evolved into English only and has a strong online presence. It is no longer socialist by any stretch of imagination. Castro begins by laying out the problem and explaining that Israel is not approaching the problem correctly. He writes, Israel's traditional approach to the problem of slanted journalism, they have uh, angry letters, op-eds, comments, is failing. Despite the valiant and intelligent efforts of the pro-Israel community, biased and misleading reporting about the Israeli-Arab conflict is as prevalent in 2020 as ever. This frustrating balance sheet has strengthened Israelis' conviction that the world hates their country and that uh, the role of journalistic holistic hostility toward Israel is atavistic anti-Semitism and or anti-Israel prejudice of Western journalists. Rafael's observation is correct, and he wants to understand how it happens, and he writes to explain the basic reason why. He continues, this deduction is, current, is certainly correct in many ways. But instead of spending energy and resources in vain pursuit of alleged anti-Semites and self-hating Jews, it would be more sensible to make an effort to understand the sociological and psychological dynamics that drive international journalists to believe and promote Arab and leftist narratives about Israel. Castro uh, presents his most significant observation now. He writes, in the case of farm reporters and progressive, with a progressive bent, this means hobnobbing with Israeli intellectuals, academics, and NGO workers while in Israel. These milieus are notorious for their ignorance about religious Judaism, lack of appreciation for the millenarian Jewish connection to the entire land of Israel. Now Castro offers a solution and he wants to educate journalists, and that makes sense, but he wants to pay them to learn about Israel and Judaism. He wants to give them books and teachers and money. This is where the idea is off the rails and totally out of touch with journalists. He concludes, given the diminishing salaries and budgets of journalists, offering them a monetary incentive to educate themselves about the conflict from a variety of viewpoints would be a relatively inexpensive yet extremely effective way of advancing Israeli interests. Bringing the voices of settlers, Jewish refugees, from Muslim countries and victims of Islamic violence to the attention of foreign journalists would help the world understand Israel better. This initiative would not limit the freedom of foreign journalists. It could instead ensure that they use the freedom to understand the conflict rather than rush to pass ill-informed judgment. Now, now, Castro is so off here. No reputable journalist will take money from an interested party to cover events. They then become PR people, not journalists. When money changes hands, credibility is totally lost. Not a good idea, though you will find in Jewish journalism today that is happening more and more. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you two cartoons today. The first is a play on coronavirus and Star Wars. It uses the example of the Force. The Force is that power which is mastered by the Jedi. It is natural and supernatural at the same time. In the case of Darth Vader, in this case, Darth Vader utilizes the chokehold in three different ways. The cartoon comes from Powerline blog dated May 16th, 2020. There are three panels. In the first panel, Vader uses pre-COVID chokehold. The second panel, he uses the safe social distance chokehold. And in the third, he uses working from home chokehold. In other words, what's going on is that Darth Vader is strangling uh, people and threatening them uh, by using this chokehold in the three different styles of, um, of coronavirus uh, self-quarantine. Um, uh, now, the next cartoon up was sent to me. It makes fun of COVID-19 
and is inspired by the idea of haircuts. The hair problem is uh, common. It's all over the place. And there are dozens and dozens of cartoons, but this was one of the funniest that I've ever seen about this issue. There were many, many cartoons poking fun at our hair and COVID-19, and this resonated with me. We went into a hunker down mode in mid-March, just after Purim. On the eve of Passover, it's customary to get a haircut within the Jewish community. And then, while continuing accounting the Omar, Omer for 50 days from Passover to Shavuot, we don't cut our hair either, except on the 33rd day of the Omer, Lagba Omer. We do not traditionally cut our hair at any other time. Now, I wanted and needed a haircut on the eve of Passover. All barbers were, of course, closed. So I went online and took an online course. I became a certified barber and cut my hair and my family's hair. I did it again on Lagba Omer. This cartoon shows exactly why. Kids with hair that, uh, uh, that's so long, it covers their eyes, say to the parent who entered the room, Mom, we need haircuts. The parent responds, I'm dad. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. There was a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism in the United States. In the state of New Jersey, let's say, for instance, the rise is even higher than the average nationally. Jewish leaders are now afraid that Jews will be blamed for the spread of COVID-19, and that will spark even more anti-Semitism. The logic is sound. The media has been covering numerous violations of social distancing in the Haredi Jewish cities, towns, and communities. Almost everyone has seen large-scale Jewish celebrations, funerals, taking place despite coronavirus. Incidents of anti-Semitism in the United States have increased 12%. But in New Jersey, anti-Semitism has increased 73%. And those are the numbers ending in 2019. They don't even reflect what's going on in 2020. And finally, which is the most evil country in the world today? Several nations vie for the distinction, probably Iran, Russia, China, they're among them. But indeed, the real honor goes to Iran. Iranian leadership, though, says that the real evil party is the United States. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what, that, what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the Jewish tradition of respecting the elders comes from an important line in the Torah. In Leviticus 19.32, the line reads, Mipne seva takum. Stand up for the elderly, show them respect, and then fear your God. This is a tremendous commandment. That is one of the reasons why even today we stand as a way of showing respect for others. We stand for the elderly, we stand for the president, we stand for a bride and groom, we stand for teachers and our rabbis. In my days as an educator, I would walk into a room and hundreds of people would stand up. Jewish tradition embraces the value of respecting elders, even when we disagree with them. Respect is essential and showing respect is what we do as Jews. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alper. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.